This video was brought to you by BetterHelp. What's up, guys? Helen here to talk about the most magical place in the world. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. That's right, home, an idyllic place where you can drink straight from the milk carton and fart in peace on your very own land. I'm thinking about getting me an appointment and go down and get my colon cleansed thoroughly. You want your colon clean? Fine, I'm gonna clean mine. Yeah, now my colon is clean. I'm talking squeaky clean. Oh, come on, who am I kidding? None of us own homes, right? Since the Great Recession in 2008, renting has become the eternal norm, especially for folks under 35. And as of 2017, more Americans were renting than had been in five whole decades. You don't need to be an expert in generational wealth to understand that there are major benefits to owning a home. And you don't need to be a scholar on housing precarity to know that there are major pitfalls to renting. You just need to have one asshole landlord raise your rent by 25% while refusing to clean out your shower drain. Ask me how I know. So how did home ownership become unattainable for so many of us? Are we doomed to be renters for our mortal lives or is there a better way? Let's find out in this video, the real reason we'll always be renters. Land ownership was basically a non-issue for much of human history, when as hunter-gatherers, we were wandering around trying not to get mauled by bears. With the mainstreaming of societies built around agriculture by around 3000 BC though, came a new sort of territoriality. This set the stage for the concept of land ownership and of course, home ownership, and it played out pretty much how you'd expect. As Andrew Beattie put it, as these farming villages grew into cities, the leading families maintained ownership by right of lineage. Their ancestors were the ones who clubbed all other challengers senseless, thus becoming the kings, pharaohs, daimyos, and sundry heads of other feudal dynasties. As a result of this, two strata of citizens were born, royals and their noble homies to whom they doled out land, and peasant tenants who paid rent in either money or labor. Later, a class of merchants would emerge and become the first common-born landlords who presumably never paid for utilities. That model probably sounds familiar, because it's the one we basically kept here in the United States, where some people own land and loads of people rent it. But the desire to own land was deeply rooted in the American psyche from the beginning, leading many to seek their fortunes out west in a very dangerous real-life version of that fun 90s computer game. So for much of American history, the majority of Americans were able to live and provide for themselves on their own small farms. That is, until industrialization and its favorite cousin, urbanization, came along and changed the housing landscape forever. But before we go on, we want to thank this video's sponsor, BetterHelp. If you've experienced anxiety or depression, or just generally felt overwhelmed lately, BetterHelp is a resource that can help you feel better. Personally, I have been experiencing anxiety for basically my whole life, so I know how effective therapy can be. BetterHelp's network of more than 30,000 therapists are ready to listen to and help you. After taking a brief questionnaire, you'll be matched with a therapist whose expertise fits your unique needs. And thanks to BetterHelp's remote model, you can work with a therapist whose skills might not otherwise be available in your area. Once you're matched, you'll be able to communicate with your therapist within 48 hours. You can message your therapist at any time and you'll receive timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule your choice of phone or video sessions to receive counseling in real time. And in the event that you and your therapist aren't a perfect match, you can easily switch to a new one for no additional charge. Personally, going to see someone who can help me provide a framework through which I can really explore the things that are bothering me has been game changing for the way that I live my whole life. So join the more than 2 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with BetterHelp by visiting betterhelp.com slash wisecrack or just click the link in video description. When you do, you'll get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash wisecrack. And now back to the show. As people, especially poor people, began to move into cities in large numbers, it became necessary to find efficient ways to house them. This led to things like New York City's busted ass tenement buildings, overcrowded, claustrophobic accommodations that saw little light or fresh air and were often riddled with crime, vermin, and bad vibes. By the late 1800s, tenement laws began to be put into place to make existence within them a little bit less soul crushing and illness inducing. And landlords were not super pumped about these new restrictions on their money making endeavors. And we've largely been locked in battle between landlords and renters ever since. Homelessness also first became an issue in America around the same time as tramps flocked to cities in search of work. Dismissed as aimless and lazy, these so-called vagrants were regularly arrested and basically informally lived in police stations. By the 1930s and 40s, the federal government began passing various acts to regulate the rental industry, establishing affordable housing for low-income citizens. Notably, public housing development was essentially put on pause under Nixon, basically never to return. Just, uh, <laughs> With increased investment under the GI Bill, by 1950, more than half of Americans owned their own homes. Importantly, discriminatory housing policies kept 
black GIs from taking advantage of that leg up, forcing them into housing developments in less desirable, underfunded urban areas. Meanwhile, for those who couldn't fork out for a mortgage, various forms of rent control policies since 1942 helped ensure some level of housing stability. And even technically unhoused people, still mostly white men at this point, had enough government welfare and social security to be tentatively sheltered in cheap urban hotels and flop houses. But the functional collapse of the social safety net in the 70s and 80s, including the slashing of funding for HUD's efforts to fix racial discrimination in housing, would have a major effect. By the 80s, homelessness would take on a new appearance due to a number of factors ranging from the gentrification of inner cities, the deinstitutionalization of mentally ill folks, and the emergence of HIV and AIDS. It went from being an aging white guy issue to one that largely affects young queer people, young people of color, women, and families. Now, living in poverty, i.e. renting, was a straight line to homelessness, not least because many housing options were simply gone. Flop houses and hotels had been gentrified away, while family homes were raised, rented, or sold for more than their former residents could possibly afford. We really tried to insert some comic relief here and came up empty because this sh is bleak. But don't worry, it gets worse. Today, this problem has, contrary to the laws of Reagan and gravity, trickled up. We not only have the impoverished and unhoused, but increasingly a middle class struggling to keep a roof over their heads too. But it's not for lack of actual roofs. That's right, America. Land of blinged out crocs, flavored seltzer, and empty houses. So many empty houses. In some major cities like Detroit and Syracuse, there are literally over a hundred empty houses for every one unhoused person. In total, some 16 million homes sit vacant across the country. That's 16 million dope house parties we've missed out on just today. Of course, if you start talking about turning them into affordable housing units or shelters, you're gonna get called a commie and, in fact, the ghost of J. Edgar Hoover is already tapping your phone as we speak. But as frustrating as it might be for those of us who think of housing as, you know, a universal human right, the truth is the commodification of home ownership makes it subject to market rules. And the market says that it's far more profitable to rent homes out than it is to sell them, especially when you buy those houses at a steal from low-income areas. And that's exactly what's been happening all over America. An increasing number of homes, rather than being occupied by actual homeowners, are treated as short and long-term rentals by their investors, who often live nowhere near their property. This new landowning class uproots existing communities while driving prices up. This prices out middle-class home buyers and shrinks the inventory of houses available to the rest of us to fantasize about on Zillow. But before you start defending honest, salt-of-the-earth landlords, it's worth pointing out that a great deal of these houses are being scooped up not by individuals, but by corporate investors. Blackstone is a big one. And Blackstone, presumably, does not throw dope house parties. According to MetLife Investment Management, institutional investors may own as much as 40% of the single-family rental homes in America by 2030. This wasn't always the case. You can trace the corporate takeover of the housing market pretty squarely to the 2008 recession. That's when, according to the United Nations High Commissioner on Human Rights, housing became financialized, i.e. treated as a commodity for wealth and investment instead of a social good. Remember when we bailed out banks but didn't bail out the people unlucky enough to receive their subprime mortgages? Basically, banks gave tons tons of shitty, risky, high-interest loans to many, many Americans, especially people of color, who were trying to fulfill their dream of home ownership. This was one big factor in the shitstorm that tanked the economy and lost a lot of people their homes. But for some, this wasn't a tragic catastrophe. As finance professor Stephen Zhao explains, it was that rare opportunity that attracted the institutions to build a portfolio out of these foreclosed properties. The thinking was simple. Buy up all the empty houses people had just lost as investments, start renting them out to other displaced people for even more money. Everybody, by which I mean corporate landlords and only corporate landlords, wins. Take New Orleans. Tom Perkins of The Guardian writes that about 45% of the parcels of land in the historic Faubourg Treme district of New Orleans, the oldest African-American neighborhood in the U.S., have become short-term rentals, namely Airbnbs. As a result of these investment properties, rent and property taxes rose, forcing out long-term residents, i.e. black families. The same thing has happened in other NOLA neighborhoods, which have essentially been converted into hotel regions. Between 2015 and 2018, the number of citywide Airbnbs went from 2,000 to 6,500. 85% of those Airbnbs are owned by investors who, it practically goes without saying, are mostly white. Regardless of how convenient Airbnbs 
Airbnb used to be before those pesky $400 cleaning fees popped up, the system is not conducive to vibrant neighborhoods. These places fill up on weekends with drunk tourists flashing for Mardi Gras beads, only to empty out into ghost towns come Monday. Meanwhile, in Newark, New Jersey, over the course of three years, nearly half of all of the city's residential property was sold to corporate buyers, according to a Rutgers University study. These investors were often completely anonymous, buyers who would purchase single-family homes in batches in a neighborhood and then just lease them out. Rutgers concluded that this raised rent, lowered home ownership, hurt the black middle class, and caused massive housing instability and displacement. As the study points out, and as we discussed in our other housing video, Homeownership in the U.S. is one of the main ways to acquire generational wealth. But it's not just about finances. When people live in the homes they own, it has positive implications for community ties and public safety. People who own homes feel much more invested in their communities. I mean, it's hard to throw a neighborhood block party when your neighbors are Blackstone and more Blackstone. That's not least because, often, Corporate owners will just straight up sit on their empty houses and cut their losses. That's because leaving a building empty for a period of time can often be more profitable than renting it out for a lower cost. Corporate investors can afford to eat their losses and wait for a renter who will pay handsomely, because they can make up the difference quickly. And all the while, there are whole neighborhoods in places like Detroit that are abandoned and derelict. Investing in making them great again is simply not a profitable endeavor. These could be vibrant places with social services, mom and pop stores and restaurants, walkability and so on. But making that happen would cost a lot of money and the return wouldn't be monetary. It would be secure, safe, affordable communities. It's worth noting that a lot of empty homes are also in places where, frankly, no one really wants to live or it'd be impractical for them to do so. Obviously, if someone is unhoused on the streets of a city with sky-high prices and little availability, we can't simply fix up a house in Appalachia and tell them to move there. Or if I'm a middle-class family from Newark, I don't really want to have to move to Detroit to be able to afford a home. We all know there are plenty of places to live much more cheaply in some parts of the U.S., but no one wants to be uprooted, whether unhoused or trying to buy their first home. That brings us to the heart of the matter, as identified by Peter Marcuse and David Madden in their book In Defense of Housing. They write, most immediately, there is a conflict between housing as lived social space and housing as an instrument for profit making. A conflict between housing as home and as real estate. In other words, we're in this mess because we treat housing as valuable most for its economic potential rather than its ability to, you know, keep people safe, secure, and unrained on. For its part, the UN describes housing as a human right. But in the United States, while there are federal laws protecting us from things like housing discrimination, there aren't any federal laws that actually guarantee us the right to housing. Or much less, laws that protect other aspects of housing the UN identifies as rights, such as habitability, affordability, and mandatory access to utilities. As Marcuse and Madden write, ultimately, the problem with making housing a commodity is that, as such, living space will be distributed based on the ability to pay, and provided to the extent that it produces a profit. But ability to pay is unequal, while the need for a place to live is universal. There is, thus, an unavoidable contradiction. In other words, when we treat housing as just another good to be bought and sold on the market and ignore the reality that trying to put a roof over your head is vastly different from wanting to own an air fryer, it has consequences. We surrender people's ability to survive to the often brutal laws of supply and demand. It's no wonder that studies have found that mortality rates are higher in counties with greater eviction rates. It's become cliche to say that we live in a time of dissolving community ties, an epidemic of loneliness, and a rise in crime rates. But what often goes unsaid is how much of this has to do with the housing crisis. We've talked about the value of living in a community where your neighboring homes are actually owned by neighbors, rather than, say, living in the neighborless anonymity of your typical apartment complex. That's obviously not the reality for a lot of people today, leading to what Marcuse and Madden call alienated housing which is defined by precarity, insecurity, and disempowerment. The extreme end of alienated housing is homelessness. But even those with a roof over their heads feel the effect. Marcuse and Madden note that precarious housing keeps people stuck in jobs they hate or relationships that aren't going great, or even just keeps them in a perpetual state of stress when the first of the month rolls around. Alienated housing disrupts what Marcuse and Madden call ontological security, or the sense that the stability of the world can be taken for granted. Needless to say, precarious housing is incompatible with such a sense of security. The era of blossoming homeownership epitomized by 1950s suburban Tupperware parties wasn't an accident. It was the result of concerted public investment, investment which has overwhelmingly dropped off. And we know we've been talking about some intense topics lately, and we know that a lot of these problems can make you want to faceplant on the front of the porch you don't own. But the 
thing is, the way we think about housing isn't a given. There are plenty of countries who conceive of it completely differently, most notably Finland, which launched a housing first policy that entitled every citizen to an apartment, regardless of finances. This led not only to the building of thousands of homes, but to the creation of a robust social support system to help people find work, gain financial independence, and take care of their health. As a result, Finland is the only country in Europe where homelessness is declining. In short, there really isn't a market incentive to make housing affordable. So if we actually want to live in a world where having a roof over your head is a right, not a luxury, it's going to require public investment and major policy initiatives. The payoff though, the ontological security we would feel if everyone knew they'd still have a roof over their heads, even when our robot overlords inevitably take over, seems worth it. But what do you guys think? Was the housing crisis inevitable? Are the YouTube gurus right that it's, I don't know, our fault that we're stuck renting? Or are there wider social phenomena to blame? Those might be leading questions, but let us know what you think in the comments anyway. Huge thanks to our patrons for all your support. If you're interested in watching our videos early without ads and getting access to our exclusive content and Discord server, check out our Patreon. And as always, thanks to all of you for watching, liking, subscribing, and feeding the algorithm. And just for hanging out with us. Catch you later. Thank <laughs> you.